Attack born in a brave heart will overcome the odds. First line of defense. First time you go into combat, basically your brains, your brains turn to water and pour out your ears, and all you're going is on instinct. If you've had a bad day at a normal job, you get in your car and you drive home. If you have a, a bad day at night around the carrier, uh, you die. These aircraft carriers are designed to take a group of airplanes any place in the world with deep water and project power. So we lay it on the line. Yeah, I'd love to kill some. <laughs> when you're dealing with aviators and trying to teach them survival skills as well as anything to deal with safety, you have a lot of defensive mechanisms involved. In an uncontrolled ejection, there's going to be a lot of positive and negative Gs. You're going to be thrown around the cockpit, and uh, you're going to have to know instinctively what to do. Had I been prepared in, for the event of death, no. Um, that was something I didn't want to talk about. That was something I didn't deal with. I had a very strong defense mechanism known as denial. And sir, you're about to get guns. Oh, what a beautiful shot. I, I think more in terms of myself, my wingman going in and just letting a lot of ordnance fly. think of an airplane as a platform and as a weapon system and then the pilot in it all three have got a match
fighter aviation is the, the purest form of uh, combat. There's always a point in every engagement uh, where you break it down to a very, very basic level, and that level is the pilot himself. The most wonderful thing in the world for a fighter pilot is to go out and beat somebody by only pulling half the Gs that the airplane is capable of and only using only half throttle, maybe, or not even using the afterburner, you know, to casually do it. But if we have a real tough threat, we've got to go to the extremes of our interval to kill them quickly and get on with something else. We're upgrading the F-14, uh, the F-14 airplane now by putting new engines in it, new avionics. It will give it a lot more th uh, thrust to weight, a lot more performance, and we'll, we'll make the weapon system easier to employ. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give the average fighter pilot a better than average chance to get the other guy first. And that's what it's all about. think of themselves as the top guns, always officers, sometimes gentlemen. In peacetime, they are pilots and technicians, but in wartime, they are some of our most professional killers. This is their story, the story of men who choose to live on the edge between war and peace. They are a high-octane mixture of ego and guts, fear and intelligence. And if this country ever goes to war, they'll be the first to see it. But there's no innocent fighter pilots up there. There's no women and children flying fighters. Everybody that you kill on another airplane is, get, is drawn X number of rubles a month to be up there. I don't worry about his wife and kids. Uh, I don't think he's worried about mine. Modern air combat, a battlefield of incredible speed and deadly technology, where life and death is decided in an instant, and there are no points for second place. I just rolled underneath like this as he's overshooting. Reverse, squeeze the trigger, he blew up that quick. But when you pass that MIG and you realize there was one human being in that airplane whose total mission was to kill you, uh, it was literally almost like it must be in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Your emotions go from fear when a guy is shooting at you to fangs out anger when you will kill anything that moves. Most of the guys that get into the business uh, probably began their training before they're married. It's a very interesting career. It's a very dynamic profession, and it's a hell of a lot of fun. I had lost a husband who was a Navy pilot in Vietnam. I now have a son who is flying the F-18. I encourage him in giving loving support as much as I can, because that's his life. That was his choice, his decision. That doesn't necessarily mean that when I'm alone, I don't cry. These characters that fly the airplanes also have, uh, have a commitment to their country. So in a case like Vietnam was, uh, we, the guys clearly saw a responsibility and a duty and, and uh, were willing to put that first. Start the battle! Start the battle! Vietnam, a war that did not end in a military victory for the United States. For the air crews who turned and burned through the skies, it brought a fear and excitement that they would never forget. Because it was so intense in such a short duration, we were so busy just doing what, what needed to be done during the actual evolution itself that we were very rarely uh, scared. A lot of apprehension before you launch, but once you launched and the details of actually flying the mission, uh, everything else just sort of faded away. It, was, it became a very, uh, not really mechanical, but at least a routine type of evolution that you went through. And then when you came back and you had a chance to sit in your room at night and think about it, then uh, you get really concerned. I guess the essence of the whole thing is that, you know, uh, a pilot goes through very intensive training to do what he does. In and it's an unfortunate thing, but in, in real honest to God warfare, you, you get a chance to, uh, to prove that professionalism and capability. So, Really, that's the the pinnacle of a, a fighter pilot's business, you know, to actually engage in, in, uh, in warfare.
Black was the biggest threat. Triple A uh, was uh, much more severe in North Vietnam than there ever had been anywhere else in the world in history, including Berlin in 1945. Uh, and most of the airplanes that were lost were lost to Flak. But Flak was kind of a random thing. You, know, you never had the feeling that uh, a particular gun was shooting at you in particular. There was just a lot of it around, and sometimes you got hit, sometimes you didn't. Uh, the scariest thing was a surface-to-air missile, which you knew uh, once one was launched, you basically watched it, made a couple maneuvers with your airplane, and if it was following your airplane, it was real obvious. And then it was a ma matter between you personally and that missile. And that was much scarier, even though it was statistically much less dangerous than AAA. It was much scarier because it was a lot more personal. Generally, you'd see them launch. Uh, there'd be a big uh, cloud of dust and smoke on the ground. And then for a while, while the booster was lit, uh, you could see the booster. You could actually see the flame. It looked like a giant flaming telephone pole coming up off the ground. They were big missiles. Visually acquire them. Once you acquired them, you did a little uh, dip with your airplane. And if the missile dipped with you, then you knew it was coming with you. The hardest thing to do was you had to wait. You couldn't maneuver too soon because if you maneuver too soon and lost all your airspeed by the time the missile got to you, uh, it wouldn't be uh, you wouldn't have enough to maneuver. So the trick was to make sure it was at you and then wait until the missile got in close and then put it as hard a move on your airplane as you could in several several dimensions at once and. Uh, Hope the, hope the missile overshot, which it normally would do. It wasn't until after I was actually hit with a surface-to-air missile uh, that fear really set in, and that bubble, uh, they say an, an ace or someone that flies a lot of combat or something wears a white scarf and is, walks around with his chest out. At that time, there was no white scarf. If you ever had so much fear that you want to throw up that, that it, it's almost uncomprehensible the anxiety of, of that thought that that you're going to be a POW. The only time I'd ask, ever asked for divine guidance was when I got in trouble. And I remember thinking, God, get me out of this one. And the airplane started to go upside down again and or right itself again. And I thought, well, God didn't have anything to do with that. I just righted the airplane. And when it did go uncontrolled again, I went, God, I didn't mean it. Well, Willie wanted to eject because the airplane was on fire from him back, and we were still over. It's like flying over downtown uh, Los Angeles. I mean, it was just solid city below us, and I knew I'd be a POW if I ejected, so I said, Willie, you stay with this damn airplane. As we rolled and rolled, it got about one mile off the beach, and it, uh, I heard a loud explosion, and the airplane went into a real violent spin. And I'd see land and water and land and water, and I'd say, wind blows from ocean to land. If I eject here, shoot's gonna, I'm still going to be a POW. So I said, Willie, stay with me. I'm going to try and get this thing one more mile off the beach. And our controls were nothing here. I didn't know it. It had blown my whole tail off. I had no controls left at all. Despite most missions in Vietnam involving bombing and escort, every pilot lived for that one chance of shooting down an enemy plane, of fulfilling that ambition to test himself in combat one-on-one. -on -one. But even with radar and missiles, Navy pilots learned that the rules for air warfare haven't changed after 50 years. I still remember to this day, I went by the initial MiG that I met. I went by him at about 50 feet away. And I can remember every single detail of that aircraft. I remember exactly what the paint looked like, exactly what color it was, and uh, the markings on the side of it and everything else. And as we start in, he starts turning toward me. As he sees me, I start turning toward him. OK, now he had a gun to shoot head on, and I did not, OK? So uh, I wasn't sure you know, whether he was going to try to shoot at me. But what I did know for sure is the fact that I didn't want to give him any room to turn. If I went by him a half a mile of beam like this, he'd have the room to start turning on right. that. Okay, so I wanted to take him as close aboard as I could so that he couldn't turn. So essentially it was a neutral start. Neither one of us had an advantage. After about 360 degrees of turn, I was able to get a shot at the guy that I'd passed. And I fired a sidewinder at him. And about that time, the other two MiGs arrived, which we didn't know about. And one of them fired a missile at me, which came by my canopy and uh, did not go off for some reason. I have no idea what it was or why it, didn't, why, it, why it didn't get me. So I left the guys in front of me alone, and I turned around to face the two guys who were behind me. When the missile went by, uh, uh, it's interesting because it was almost over 
before it uh, before I had time to think about it. And uh, one of the things that I think most pilots train themselves to do is to not react to something that's history. Uh, you react to what's going to happen next. I just got through breaking from 36 SAMs that were fired at us over Quang Lang Airfield. And as I came out of a SAM break, just trying to get out of the area, I saw two MiG-21s at treetop level exiting the target. Uh, one was about 500 feet, the other one was about 800 feet stepped up like this. And I was doing about 650 knots at treetop level. And as I came up behind the, the one MiG-21, uh, Willie said he's locked. He had a little look up. And just as I fired the missile, and the missile came off the side, he went into about, looked like about an 8G turn. And you could just see the vapor trails turning off of his wings. I did an aileron roll and then brought my nose back to him. And just as he dropped his wing, I shot my second missile. No MiG had been shot down in almost two years. The realization was like a dream. Uh, the adrenaline was there, uh, just like when you win a gold medal in the Olympics. Uh, the excitement was there. Certainly to live from day to day, uh, there's really nothing glorious about it. You watch your friends die. You know, uh, the third day I was there on my first cruise, I lost my roommate. Uh, he had a, a wife at home with a, who was three months pregnant. You know, just uh, he, so he never saw that baby. Uh, without a doubt, I can look back at that time in my life, and I've, I've never lived more intensely from day to day than I lived then. constant stress of uh, combat and for me my last cruise in Vietnam was uh, almost a year from start to finish uh, it's very difficult to uh, to come down from combat uh, to some people was in fact addicting and it had tendencies in that direction for everybody I think you either one thing or another if you if you finally got to the point where you could handle it completely dispassionately it was time to start worrying about whether or not you were going to be able to react to uh, civilian life. If you finally lost all the fear of it, then you were going to have a very difficult time when you got back, uh, back to the uh, to the real world. Even after coming back on the ship after the first kill, uh, they had a party. All the skippers were there, all the people in the celebration. And then someone walked up to me and says, "Hey, Duke, what's it like to kill somebody else?" And that was the first time that it really hit me square in the face. Matter of fact, I left the party and it bothered me so much. Uh, I went to my room by myself. It still brings a lot of pain. Um, and I had to seek the help of a chaplain. I, didn't, I couldn't go to my fellow fighter pilots because that wasn't macho. I couldn't go to my commanding officer because I thought he'd worry about me in combat after that. So I went to the only person that I thought I, I could and I went to the chaplain. Uh, he told the skipper in the long run and I told the skipper that I could do the same thing over again, but it just bothered me a little more than I thought it would. Anyone who's honest will, uh, who's, who's a, a real professional carrier pilot, I think will say that, uh, that he actually enjoys it. You gotta qualify that, and if you, you can take a lot of this statement out of context, <clears throat> but, because there is nothing glorious or, or good about killing other people. And that's basically what war is all about. There is something that is, uh, in terms of a challenge, you can't find anywhere else uh, in, in life. You know, there's no, no uh, success or failure thing like you'd find maybe on Wall Street in terms of making a killing on the market. What you're doing in aerial combat or and escorting other airplanes into a target, or actually, as we did in Phantoms, actually doing uh, doing the bombing and rolling in on a target uh, ourselves and the fighters. Uh, there, the criterion for success is very clear cut. You either do it right and 
stay alive, or you do it wrong and you die. So that does give you a rush, you know, if you if you want to look at human emotions, it, it's an exhilarating thing. And that's a, that's a sad thing, that's a sad commentary on, on what war is all about, but it's true. Most of the time, the Vietnamese pilots were very poor. Unless they had a real advantage, they would not engage. Colonel Toon flew all three aircraft, the MiG-17, 19, and 21. He had 13 American kills to his credit. Just the fact that he had shot so many of our airplanes down, we wanted to eliminate him. We didn't go out looking for him every time. Uh, you always would hope that you would run up against him to meet him so you could eliminate him. And on 10 May 1972, when there were 22 MiGs and six F-4s turning and burning over the skies of Vietnam, we decided just to, to get out of Dodge at that time, hauling toward the Gulf of Tonkin. You can see the water up ahead of us heading east, and that's where I saw a single MiG coming at me. My exact comment to Willie, watch this, Willie, and I'm going to scare the blank out of this gomer. Okay. Pressed him right down the snot locker like this, and all of a sudden his wing roots lit up. And it, it surprised me. I went vertical like this. Okay, now my mind comes in. Gomers, unless they had an advantage, would run. Hanoi was that way. Okay. So I went pure vertical, totally expecting the Gomer to make to keep running and get toward his field and unload. And as I came back over the side like this and looked in the vertical over my ejection seat, straining to look behind me, I looked up and I saw a little set of Gomer goggles, a little Gomer scarf and we were going canopy to canopy. And Willie came up one time and says, Duke, maybe we better let this guy go. And I said, Willie, no. And I remember the, the anger. I remember just, just gritting my teeth and going, and thinking, pulling. And I would have rammed him if I had to at that time. Came into a third time on a head-on maneuver like this. Well, this time, for some reason, I think, every time I'd out-zoomed him in this vertical pull, he pulled his nose up first, nice and easy, trying to save the G and energy. Well, when he pulled his nose and looking at a place like this, I came back to idle, put out the speed brakes and dropped my flaps. And what it looked like was something like, you know, I just really put on the G here to end up slide in behind him. But now I'd misjudged and I ended up about six, 700 feet behind him. I mean, I'm looking right up from here to the wall at him. And I can't shoot him with a Sidewinder missile. It's in min range, okay? At those air speeds, he has got the advantage even though he's out in front. So I tried to disengage once I saw my mistake, stood on the rudder like this, trying to keep the F-4 from departing. And as I rolled this direction, his airplane went like this and departed. And looked, and when he reversed like this, I expected him to really totally pull back in and try and shoot me. But instead, he started running. And I remember thinking, well, I'm gonna get away. And then he went a little farther, and I thought, well, if you're gonna run, I'm not going to. So I reversed. Used just rudder, unloaded the airplane, got a sidewinder tone, shot, and a little piece came off the airplane. When I pulled off of him, the relief that came from it, it's almost like being reborn. Duke Cunningham and Willie Driscoll are the Navy's only aces in Vietnam. And when you realize that the average engagement lasts only 120 seconds or so, it's the ultimate video game. And living or dying is the payoff. I'd get up and I'd basically just sort of address the possibilities of the day, one of which is I'd get killed, another one of which was that I'd make it back okay, and the third one was I'd end up as a prisoner of war in Hanoi. These are film clips taken in combat and never seen before in public. They have been slowed down to give you a closer look of actual air-to-air -air warfare. These battlefield scenes underline the rules of dogfighting. Speed is life never ever become predictable. Keep the enemy on the defensive. Believe in yourself and react to the situation. And never forget that if you have to think, you're dead. Only a fraction of today's top guns have actually seen combat, and their victories over Soviet-made aircraft are depicted right here on these walls. But the majority of pilots have spent their entire professional career just practicing and waiting for a war that hasn't come yet. But if war does come, these guys will be instant heroes, pitting their $32 million supersonic aircraft against somebody else's. But until that day, they wait. And while they wait, they dream and they play. 
everyone in the Navy that flies strives to become a fighter pilot. That is the primary goal of everybody that enters flight training. I grew up watching all the war movies, all the war pictures, and I read all the comic books and all that. And both my older brothers were in the Army, short tours, but uh, it's all I ever really wanted to do. The whole thing is a lifestyle, and it's, you know, it's fly hard, party hard, constantly raise hell, I mean, because that's what I'm going to be expected to do. You know, when the when the shooting starts. I don't think my image as a, as a younger naval aviator was the same as it is right now. And I think that probably had some to do with uh, uh, the end of my first marriage. It's just like the old, you know, the two gunfighters. Uh, on the street by themselves or the two gladiators in the middle of the ring by themselves. Uh, everything else is taken out, all the, uh, the extraneous factors are taken out, and it's just you and him. I mean, I've been playing Navy, I mean, since I started ROTC, it's been more than 10 years now, and literally everything I've worked for for 10 years is to go out and pull a trigger against a county that she had made in defense of my country. So, I mean, that's everything I've worked for for 10 years, and wouldn't it be nice to do it? kill anybody else as if he guns it. We yeah. carry all these million dollar missiles on board this thing and stuff, but a fighter pilot hasn't really killed anybody unless he guns them. Man, I mean, man. it's like, you know, to me as a real, you know, I mean, my favorite shot would be a 100 mile Phoenix shot, you know, on a, uh, on a backfire. Would John Wayne take like, a 100 mile Phoenix shot? I just like to watch, you Would know. Would John that. Wayne do that? They want to fill the guy's, the, the, uh, the enemy's silk scarf in their cockpit cook these rounds off at him and watch the canopy explode and the scarf come flying off, you know what I mean? That's, that is a fighter pilot's kill, you know? I want yeah. that Gomer to look back over his shoulder and read Lieutenant Norm Walker on the side of the cockpit just as I pull the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> so like they always say, you train like you fight and you're always training to uh, go out and uh, shoot the missile regardless of whether it's on there or not. And you always do squeeze the trigger, even in practice. So when they actually put a missile on there, you're going to do exactly the same thing, except this time when you squeeze your trigger, it's going to come off. important thing. Getting into the fight, engaging, killing, and then exiting the fight arena. That to me is the heart of it, the 1v1 engagement where you break it down and it's, it's just you against him and only one person's going to walk away. You train all your life for that one time you might go against another airplane and get to shoot it down, but nowadays you're crazy if you want to go to war. Everybody's got sophisticated weapons and you know a lot of people are going to get killed. Nobody really wants to fight a war. But that's what I'm trained for, and if you want to call it a trained killer, I guess you could. Everybody is trained to go out there, and if uh, duty calls, you're going to go out there and you're going to shoot that guy down, and you're going to drop that bomb, just as we've showed a couple times, uh, you know, these little skirmishes we've had. The reason why uh, people can sit around and, uh, and talk and say what they want and basically watch whatever they want and do whatever they want is because guys like us are out here on the carrier. We may not actually be fighting anybody, but we're out there as our presence telling people, hey, don't mess with us because this is what you're going to have to fool with if you do. You know, the carrier sitting out there may not actually be fighting a war, but people know, hey, that thing can come in here and kick some ass. I don't think we've got to push the United States around too much. Aggressiveness, certainly in our business, is definitely a prerequisite. And aggressiveness, does, like I said, does not mean being the loudest son of a bitch in the bar and being able to throw your, your glass the farthest. 
What is required is when you step into an airplane, you want to lie, cheat, steal to beat the other guy. Here's a lesson in life and death economics. You take an airplane that costs $33 million to build, $10,000 an hour to fly it, it lands on an aircraft carrier that costs almost $4 billion, and then, for a mere $30,000 to $60,000 a year, the Navy finds pilots who make it all work. All they have to do is survive, and the plane comes home with them. The whole scenario of uh, where people fight has changed over the last uh, 15 years. When I first came in the Navy, we were still dropping bombs at 50,000 feet, and you never got close to the enemy. And of course, as their defense mechanisms became more sophisticated, they could blow us out of the sky at almost any altitude. And so when you start looking at the threat, and if you pay attention and you, and you uh, are sensitive to the squadron's uh, position, you find out that uh, they're flying lower and lower and, and faster and faster. The difference in the speed of an engagement, uh, I think when you're really getting close, probably isn't all that different between aircraft of a generation ago and today. But I think that the difference is the, uh, the fact that they're going to be able to um, identify them earlier. They're going to be able to perhaps employ uh, much more sophisticated uh, electronics and uh, ordnance in order to neutralize these folks. I think the uh, difference between a fighter pilot now and a fighter pilot a few years ago is a fighter pilot of today's Navy is more of a weapon system manager. There's more required in the cockpit than there was in the past. He's got to be not only a good uh, stick and throttle man, but now he has to be a, a weapon system manager while he's airborne. When you put yourself in an environment where you have hundreds of airplanes flying around, uh, that is not easy. For example, you'll have somebody passing you, and you'll have to analyze, is that a MiG-21? What's his turn rate? Does he have the lateral separation to turn on me? Can I get from this point to that point before he gets where he can bring his weapons to bear? Those are split-second decisions that you have to analyze and be able to view, and you have to have a three-dimensional picture in your mind on what's going around. Every fighter crew knows that air-to-air -air combat is the ultimate challenge for his profession. But it is virtually impossible for the layman to realize what transpires in a dogfight or air combat arena. One way to experience something of this violence is to perceive it in terms of visual relationships. The viewer must account for his own airplane, the terrain, the horizon, the sky, the sun, and the enemy all at once. If you could survive your first five missions in combat, chances are you survive. Uh, but it's that first five where everything is just, you know, chaos. Uh, you're not used to the load, the stress, uh, the rapidity with which things are happening. Uh, just overcomes people. In World War I, they had many, many airplanes. They had more time. You know, you'd see an airplane 10 miles away, it'd take you 20 minutes to get there. Uh, now, a lot of times when you see an airplane, he's already launched his weapon at you. At a mile away, a MiG-21 is a dot. And the whole intent of the way we train right now is to expose people to that first five missions, basically in peacetime, so that by the time they get into actual combat, they've already gone past that plateau. It's by far the most realistic training they'll ever get, and it's probably as close to real combat as we can get without actually shooting people. You have to say, today I'm going against MiGs. And if I die in training, that means I would really die in combat. That's why that the tax range is so good for us, is that you can come back and analyze all of those things, and you can pick out your mistakes. You may not even see the three that are coming over here 10 miles away, or you might be turning your tail to them. That sticks in that computer that you use. And 
just the mere fact of having the opportunity to train on a daily basis is the key to any pilot success today or the future with the laser weapons coming down the line with technology and aircraft performance little has changed since Rick Tobin and Immelman as I mentioned they wrote the dictus on how to kill and survive in the air along with Oswald Boca back in 1915-1916 a lot of those same rules apply today Fighter Weapons School, also known as Top Gun, is designed to give advanced training on how to fight and destroy Soviet-made aircraft. The reason we use the uh, Northrop F-5 in the uh, Top Gun course of instruction is that it's a pretty fair simulator of the Soviet MiG-21, which is one of the most wildly exported uh, aircraft in the world today. We teach the people to beat this aircraft so that they can go with confidence out into the fleet knowing that they can beat the MiG-21. An additional factor is that the pilots at Top Gun fly in this airplane are probably among the best uh, adversary or fighter pilots in the world. So the fact that they can beat a Top Gun pilot in this aircraft is a confidence builder to them that they can beat a MiG-21 no matter who's flying. The ability to fly airplanes, especially in a tactical arena, is not something, it's not like riding a bicycle. It's not something you can uh, stop for five years, get back on, and uh, still be proficient at it. That's one of the reasons that we uh, uh, stress uh, pilot proficiency and pilot currency. We can't fly ACM unless we've flown ACM in the last seven days. Because it's a dangerous arena, we want to make sure that the accident rate uh, is kept low so that we can indeed employ the airplanes to the edges of its envelope. The scenario during a Top Gun flight is not competitive in nature. The, both air crew will fly their aircraft to the limit, but the uh, main objective is a teaching situation. If you get too competitive, you're not going to learn from it. Because all you're going to do is your mind is going to build a picture of what happened. And you're always going to win. Whether you lose or not, you're always going to win. And the only thing that's going to come out of that is, is you're going to think that you're great. And maybe you're not. And then uh, you're going to fly into combat someday thinking you're great. And you're not going to be. And you're going to die. You have to build confidence, first of all, in your abilities to fly the aircraft, your own aircraft, to its limits. And secondly, to fly your airplane against another well-flown aircraft. And that's what we do here at Top Gun. Exploit the strengths of our airplanes and the weaknesses of their aircraft. In order to win in air-to-air -air combat, you have to fly your airplane closer to the edge of its performance envelope than the other guy flies his. And that hasn't changed since World War I. You basically have to go closer to the edge than he does. And when you train or fight in actual combat, that close to the edge, occasionally somebody goes over. And when you exceed the performance envelope of an aircraft, it goes out of control. Uh, it goes into some kind of a spin. In tactical jet aircraft, they're extremely violent, extremely disorienting. And in the past, we've had a very high loss rate in that situation. Uh, in 1978, the Navy started using the T-2, which is a jet trainer, uh, as a spin simulator. And in that aircraft, we can take uh, fleet fighter pilots up, put them in an out-of-control situation, and simulate exactly what their aircraft will do when it's out of control. If you've seen the situation before, you can react to it.
To elaborate on the positive and negative Gs, that's certainly uh, one situation that an aircraft can go into if all of a sudden it lost its tail, or if it was going into any type of uh, uncontrolled flight, it's going to be spinning around. And I think you know, if you took something like this, if you took an aircraft, for instance, and all of a sudden it stalled, it could just be falling out of the sky, just going down like this. And as it goes down, the pilot's going to be going back and forth. I mean, he could be doing all sorts of things. If you actually were to paint a picture of what happens uh, prior to and during an ejection, I think sometimes you have to look at what's going on inside the, the pilot's mind, and that's when does he recognize that he's really in trouble. And that's something that we probably try to teach more than anything else, is when do you actually get out? A lot of people have a tendency to want to stay with the aircraft. But as soon as you realize that your instrument panel is a Christmas tree light, and all of a sudden all of the hydraulics is gone and all of your stick control is gone, you know, you have to start thinking about what to do. There is a certain sense of denial for most people who are flying a jet aircraft. Like I said before, there's, uh, you, you don't get up in the morning thinking you're going to crash your aircraft. There are some people who seem to be rather casual uh, about the training we give, as if it's not important to them. Uh, but it's always interesting to watch some of these people because they may be looking rather bored, but they've always got one eye and one ear open to what you have to say. Get in a proper body position, heels on the deck, balls of feet on the rudder pedals, thighs flushing out over the seat pan, hips back, shoulders back, reach up, grab the face curtain. Okay, bring your elbows in a little bit. On my count of three, I want you to go ahead and eject. I'm convinced that everything we do and everything we say is, is important to them in order to survive. One, two, three, eject. Our challenge is to make it uh, pertinent to his environment. If we're going to be talking about ejections, we need to be talking about something that uh, he can look at in terms of a recent experience that, uh, that is going to get his attention. Eject over 250 miles an hour. The problems basically are just flailing injuries with the wind blast. The seat's designed for about 450 knots, and that's roughly around 400 miles an hour. And with that, again, the flailing injuries are going to be the biggest problem with the wind blast, taking your hands away or, or having some problems around the facial area, ripping masks and helmets away. The ocean's coming up quick, and basically the cold water is the biggest environment there that's going to try to kill you. We had a pilot. Uh, one of the local squadrons just recently went through an ejection, uh, and it was exactly the same thing with a uh, catastrophic uh, engine failure. Tail uh, essentially probably just blew off the aircraft. Again, a lot of positive, negative Gs, a lot of buffeting. Um, he was a type of individual that probably uh, denied the fact that this is what ever happened to him. It always happens to the other guy. That's, that's common. Um, and at some point, he, I think, had a religious experience. going in excess of 400 knots. Uh, luckily, his parachute worked properly, all of his survival gear worked properly. But when he got in the water, uh, he was in the middle of the ocean uh, with 10-foot swells. He was hurt. He was getting seasick. Uh, he was having a hard time uh, using his survival gear. He uh, remembered very vividly all of the survival training he had ever had. Orly, inflate your LPA! To survive high-speed ejections and water impact requires constant training. To survive in a dogfight means killing the other guy before he kills you. And two requires constant training and a spirit of aggressiveness that would exhaust most people. Competition without a learning capacity, however, is more deadly than a heat-seeking missile. I went through Top Gun, okay, and, and, and Top Gun uh, was where I basically learned, basically where I spent most of my time, how 
a Rio should be in an ACM engagement. I learned from those guys. And also, uh, I'm, I'm a believer in speed is life. You know, speed is life. There's a, there's a difference in personality between a fighter pilot and a Rio. And uh, it's, I, I, I enjoy being a Rio for one of the reasons that I get to fly with different pilots. When you get a fighter pilot in a cockpit of an airplane, you, you find a, uh, a person there that's just, you never see anywhere else. You'd never see him in the ready room or anywhere else. And that person, uh, who, no matter who he is, whether he's the worst fighter pilot in the squadron, you, you know he is, or whether he's the best fighter pilot in the squadron, you know he is. When he's in the airplane, he is always the best fighter pilot in the squadron. It's been my experience that he will never, ever admit to himself which is very important. He will, he will have has a very hard time admitting to himself that somebody else in the squadron beat him. He holds people in contempt. I think the the general nature of a fighter pilot or a pilot in general, but in particular a fighter pilot, is, is competition, is a competitive nature. You have to be competitive to survive. You have to be competitive to, to do well, to, to be professional or to be to be good at what you do. And to me, that's, that's the whole key. Uh, I am very, very competitive in nature. I don't like to lose. I like to win all the time. Uh, so I, I kind of push myself all the time to win, to be competitive. To be perfectly honest, I think there's three of us in a squadron that are equals. We could go out on any one day and fight each other and come back just depending on the circumstances. Any one of us could come out on top. I consider myself to be in that top three. In this squadron here, I, I, I personally feel there are only a few people who are really competitive and really good fighter pilots. And Lone Star happens to be one of them. And we've we have kind of a uh, personal thing together when we, when we go out and fight one another because we both feel that we're fairly good at what we do. We're both fairly professional and uh, take, take what we do fairly seriously. There's always that competition. You're always trying to be the best, whether it be landing on the carrier or shooting the missiles or going out and fighting your airplane against the other guy. You never want to be second best. You're always trying to be number one. Most engagements, most aerial engagements are very, very short. Uh, in fact, less than 60 seconds. Uh, anything that runs over 60 seconds, now you're, you're st the odds are starting to actually fall against you. So most engagements are very, very quick. Old well, practice setting a guy up behind us and trying to, trying to sucker him into making a move from which he can't recover at the same time while we're, we're working to get behind him. There's several different ways of doing that. One would be to, to get the guy to commit his nose down at the same time that you're slowing down and pulling your nose up. If he gets his nose buried like that, he can't get it up in time and he'll shoot out in front of you and you just roll in behind and shoot him. There's the guns on the F-14. The idea is, is to not get shot. That's the primary goal in, in, a, in a defensive fight, is to keep the other guy from shooting you. And the way you do that is to keep his nose off of you, whatever it is. It's a very violent type of flight. You're looking over your shoulder all the time, flying the airplane, you know, and looking over your shoulder. He still makes a, a couple of mistakes, and he has made a couple of mistakes with me and allowed me to get the advantage over him. But so far, uh, he's not been able to get the advantage over me. Tell me how his nose isn't on me, but I'm in deep trouble here. Although only the pilot can physically control the plane, when engaged in close okay, and the sky is full of bogeys, the pilot doesn't complain. There are two sets of eyes looking out the window instead of one, and he knows that no matter how tough it gets, the Rio is always right behind him. I had to explain what a Rio was to my mom for about four years before she understood it. In this particular airplane, on the F-14, as in the, as in the uh, Phantom, which I flew for six years before this, uh, you basically operate all the weapon systems on board. In this airplane, we do the radio communications, although the pilot can certainly do that. And we're basically in charge of the navigation, electronic warfare systems. But uh, even that doesn't really describe it. It's really a two-man crew. I think a good way of describing a competition you're looking for, like between me and Russ, as flying with Rios, is, would be a lot like, <laughs> this is going to sound funny, would be a lot like flying with Rios Flying with a lot of different Rios, it's a lot like flying with a lot of, or sleeping with a lot of different women. They all, re, they all rate your performance and they all talk among each other, you know? <laughs> so there's the competition right there that, you know, you, you want to be the best lover this girl ever had, and you also want to be the best pilot this Rio ever had. I think everybody has their own idea of who the best pilot in the squadron would be, or the best handful of pilots. I don't think we verbalize that too much. 
but I bet if you were to get secret ballots from everybody, I, I bet you would come up with the same two or three names as who they thought the best pilot or the best NFO was. You can't help but have a subliminal type pecking order that people kind of acknowledge. We train on a, on a daily basis and you can't go in and expect to be King Kong every time and win every time. But every time that a shot is called that is a valid shot against me, I learn something from it and I try and minimize those exposures to a shot opportunity by the, the hostile threat. The prize in this case would be your life. Uh, as Patton said, you never, uh, you don't win a war by dying for your country, you win the wars by making the other dumb bastard die for his country. And uh, I really take that to heart. It's, it's kind of humorous, but it, uh, it really is true. So uh, I think the prize that you speak of in this case would be, would be your life uh, and your, your aircraft, naturally, and uh, you're around to fight again another day. By almost anybody's standards, flying jets in peacetime is dangerous. The top guns hone their skills and play their sophisticated war games. Everybody knows it's only a game, but these guys seem eager, almost hungry for a real fight. They're students of warfare, and now they wait to graduate. I sort of view us as a, a football team that practices all the time but never gets to play a game. And that may sound bloodthirsty, and, I, and maybe it is, I don't know. But, uh, you know, I've devoted 13 years to learning how to operate weapon systems well, hopefully well. And I'd like, at some point in time, if the country says they need that expertise, to be able to go ahead and, and show what I think I've got. My biggest thrill would be able to uh, would, would be able to go out there representing my country when some of these little uh, these little two bit nations come and try and rub our noses in it, <laughs> i.e. Uh, Libya, Banana Republic. I mean, you know, some of these little guys come out and they make these big threats and innuendos. And here you got the entire United States, and you got these guys that are uh, steel workers back in Pittsburgh that would love if they had the money to go over there and break beer bottles over the head. And I kind of feel like I'm representing those guys out there. You know, I mean, I'm gonna I'm carrying a beer bottle. You know, and they may not be over there, but these guys coming out saying, we kill you American dogs, and I come out and say, try this on, pal, Fox 1. <laughs> operations that without ear protection a person would become unconscious within minutes and even die on this 1,000 feet of rolling steel there is only one mission launching and recovering aircraft in all weather no matter the time of day or night more dangerous than flying a mission maybe not but men can die here very quickly jet wash can literally blow a man off the deck here, the top guns are in their element, but they're not alone, with over 5,000 men on board to support and maintain a battle readiness that makes the carrier a small but awesome zone of power projection. It is an airfield on top of a city, and no top gun could even dream about killing MiGs without the maintenance and crew guys. Nobody knows it better than the pilots. When you're flying, especially at sea, there aren't too many mistakes that you can make and live through. You get a, uh, an airplane that's uh, just a routine, you know, a couple of guys, both of them qualified over a thousand hours in the airplane type thing, flying down, coming down to shoot, they, uh, they ask to take a turn or they say, uh, okay, approach, we're going to make a 360 here for, to dump gas or to do something, they go roger, and then they just disappear. You never see them again. And and uh, they fly into the water. You never understand, you know, I mean, to me, I, as, as much as you'd like to try and shake that type of a thought out of your head, you can never really do that. I can never really forget that uh, I, just, I just wonder what, what, what so-and-so was looking at in the back seat when he let his pilot fly him into the water. Why did he do that? We left and the deck was pitching quite a bit. 
And when that happens, they'll cycle the launch with the deck. So when the deck is up, hopefully they'll time it in sequence. But you can sit on the cat ready to go and be looking <laughs> what you perceive to be right at the water. And you'll see the deck count. So when we left, we knew the, the ship was moving a lot. When, when I came back, there was water breaking over the bow because the ship was moving that much. And that sort of puts a little bit of fear of God in you. That was, that was one of the roughest days I've ever had to come back. Just trying to find a home. As big as those ships are, they're just incredibly small sometimes. I've read reports and, and heard that they did the test during the Vietnam War to, you know, they wired pilots up for sound and let them go on combat hops to see what the heart rate was and all that. That the needles all pegged the highest when they came back and shot the carrier landings. If there was a shooting war on, of course, our number one competition would be who's killing the most MiGs. In peacetime and even in a war, the next biggest competition is a pilot's carrier landing performance. And that'll make them or break them, literally. In peacetime, it almost makes your aviation career how well you fly uh, around the ship, which is the difference between us and the Air Force. The grades are posted in the ready room. There's a ladder posted that says who the top guy is and who the anchor man is. And that's a lot of visibility. And uh, guys fight not to be that last guy on the, on the bottom, you bet. We're uh, underway on deployment and you know, the most visible thing is your landings at the back end of the ship, and so that's where all the effort goes. You know, like you have the greeny board that says, you know, exactly where you stack up in the squadron, whether you're the best carrier landing pilot in the squadron or whether you're the worst. And the only thing that matters is that you're off the bottom. If you're on the bottom, God forbid. I think that the best pilots in the world, even including the Israelis or Navy pilots, hands down. And the reason why is because every time they come aboard a ship, every time somebody's looking at them, the LSO's grading them, you know, they do it. The, the captain of the ship's looking at them, the skipper's looking at them. And you want to talk about pressure. You know, you want to talk about pressure. These guys, you know, they learn to live with it. It's no big deal for me. Hey, we get back with all the big parts. Hey, I'm happy. You know, I'm back on deck. It's no big deal with me. There's not a, there's not a sign up there saying, you know, uh, Slick talked on the radios good Wednesday, but he did a bad job talking on the radios on Thursday. You know, nobody says anything to me like that. The pilots always know if they screwed up. They don't need anybody. They don't need me telling them that. I've always viewed my job flying with a guy as being maybe 20% naval flight officer, 30% psychologist, and 50% good friend, you know, because that's all a guy really needs is a calm, good friend in the back seat that's on his side. You don't need another guy saying, you should have flown that past just a little, I could, my mother could, you know, you don't need that. Anybody that comes aboard a ship is a good, is a great pilot. And then there's everybody else. You know, but the one common denominator is around the ship, bringing the airplane aboard. That's where everybody just kind of falls into that big pot. And those people that don't bring it aboard, i.e. the P-3 guys, the B-52 drivers, the, the Eagle F-15 drivers, F-16 drivers, you know, the Israelis, they don't land aboard a ship. You know, they got, you know, they got a nice stationary 200 foot wide, 16,000 foot runway. Jeez, even I can do that, you know. It's just like, <laughs> you know, come on. You're a naval aviator assigned to an aircraft carrier for nine months at a time and now have the opportunity of knowing the real meaning of fear. I mean, try to imagine landing a jet fighter on 700 feet of heaving landing strip in the middle of the ocean at night. It's pitch black, no horizon, no depth perception. You have to trust your instruments. As you approach the carrier, your plane could be affected by a sudden gust of wind, making it climb or descend without warning. You have no way of knowing if it's your plane that's moving or if it's the roll of the ship in the water. You trap on the deck going 150 miles an hour and you stop in two seconds. At sea, at night, it's dark and the, and the deck is pitching. You can, you'll come in a couple times and, and realize to yourself, why am I doing this? You know, For all practical purposes, I should be dead. That's the worst thing about nights, is you sit up there. As soon as you launch, all you can think about is in another hour and a half, you're going to have to land. So it's a very time-consuming event. You look at your watch and say, God, I've got another hour before I have to come down. I've got 30 minutes now. Try it yourself. 
put a postage stamp in the middle of your living room floor and then turn off all the lights. Take a running leap and dive head first. If you lick it with your tongue, congratulate yourself because you've just survived a night carrier landing. They say that everybody has their night in the box. I had mine fairly early in my experience. Went around four times. Got waved off once because uh, I was all screwed up. And every time that happens to you, you get just a little bit more of the vertigo effect. You get just a little bit more tired because you're really working your butt off. You fly instruments the whole way as best you can. Try not to focus too much on the ship, but you try and cheat with it. I remember looking out to try and find the land landing area at about a quarter of a mile. And uh, <laughs> the deck had come up. And uh, the perception I had was that I could see the name Carl Vincent right in front of me. Uh, it didn't scare me much, except for just overwhelming terror. It's embarrassing when you don't make it the first time. And it's even more embarrassing when you don't make it the second and third time. Uh, it's, it's real important because uh, you can get out there, and if you can't get aboard, eventually, you, when you're out at sea, you're going to have to jettison the aircraft and go for a swim. Uh, that's the ultimate embarrassment. As you get in close to the ship at night on a night pass, everything begins to tighten up. You begin, you have to make teeny tiny little corrections and uh, if you see something that you don't like, sometimes an instantaneous movement happens or you overcorrect and, and uh, you bolter and that's what happened to me. I, I don't remember exactly what it was that happened, but ended up getting high again and uh, missing the wires and had to go around again. So coming around, I just, you know, I'm just forcing myself to put all of this out of my mind and just fly the approach and that's, what I did, and, and uh, finally got aboard. It wasn't pretty, but... <laughs> we were getting real good starts last night. We were doing pretty good work on the, on the self-contained GCAs. Uh, the deck happened to be moving up and down quite a bit, and those who are out there will also claim the ship has got a little bit of a Dutch roll to it, which means the fan tail will kind of corkscrew around all of which translates into the fact that even though you may not be doing anything, the apparent deck motion is quite a bit and you may miss a wire for a region that was beyond your control. We fly around with the, with the cockpit set up so that if I can, I can eject both crewmen out of the airplane if we should get into an extremist situation because the pilot literally has got two hands full just keeping the wings level or the attitude set on the airplane or trying to get the, the burners engaged or whatever might be required not to hit the ship. Power back on and uh, back to the right to line up. Power, 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 power. Check it, check it, check it. I'm a believer in, uh, you know, when you get born, you get uh, X number of heartbeats. And when those heartbeats are up, you could be 10 miles behind the boat or you could be, uh, you know, you could be walking across, the, uh, you know, the uh, street. It. Without question, a night carrier landing is the hardest thing we ever have to do in peacetime from an aviation standpoint. And I'm not so sure it's not the hardest thing you do even in, in a combat situation. There is a basic contradiction in these men who keep the peace and silently wait for war. They are our best and brightest, and yet would be the first to kill and die if war came. Smart enough to operate the most sophisticated of our technology, their instincts are as primal as any killer. In the American arsenal, they truly are the top guns. Soviet aircraft are not as capable, current frontline Soviet aircraft are not as capable as our frontline aircraft are. Uh, however, uh, they have a uh, tremendous advantage in numbers in almost any theater that uh, we're likely to go in. Uh, that not only the Soviets, but the Soviet client states as well have large numbers of aircraft that are not quite as capable as ours. So it's really numbers versus quality.
Some good. 